today's scripture is from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will, he will save his people from their sins. Please stand and sing, What Child Is This? This, this is Christ the King. He takes her by surprise to Ellis Island, and he shows her a logbook with the name of her great-great-grandfather, the first person in her family to come to America. Only it doesn't have the desired effect that he was hoping for. He was hoping that she would be overwhelmed with joy. Instead, she runs out of the room screaming and crying. It, it, a huge backfire. For him, it, it turns out that the relative who first came to America from her family was an infamous serial killer. <laughs> a part of their family history that she would rather have forgotten. But we, we all have things in our family history that we would like to forget, right? So we're now in the Christmas season, and every Christmas season there's a, there's a pastor's holiday dilemma that comes up. Which is, 
every year, how do we tell the Christmas story in a way that I haven't told it 10 times before so that you're not just, okay, I've heard this sermon 15 times, right? How to tell the Christmas story in a new way. There's 1,189 chapters in the Bible. And every December, we spend about a month, about one-twelfth of the year, really talking about maybe nine of those 1,189 chapters, right? How do we do that in a different way? I mean, we, there's about two chapters in Matthew we look at. There's about two chapters in Luke, one chapter in Micah, and then a few scattered chapters in Isaiah. We tend to focus on around Christmas. So how do I say that? How do we share something new? And I was thinking about that. A few weeks ago, as I started to outline what do the messages look like this Christmas season. And as I was looking over those familiar passages, I realized something. So I'd invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 1. Something that I, I know I've not talked about before, and something that just kind of stuck out to me this year. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. I'm not going to read them to you, because as soon as you open to that passage, you're going to realize... Oh, this is the genealogy of Jesus. Pastor Jeff, thank you for not reading this to us word for word. But I'll invite you to kind of glance over those verses, if you will. The genealogy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as you do so, you'll notice that there's some great names in there, right? We've got Abraham, who, who you know, the, the one that... God promised, I will bless all nations on earth through you. And then his son Isaac, who was born miraculously. And we see Jacob, and we see David, and we see Solomon, who wrote all of, you know, the, the Proverbs. The wisest man who ever lived on the earth. We see Rahab, uh, the prostitute that welcomed the Israeli spies and, and then was saved and becomes part of the genealogy of Jesus. Think about that. She's not Jewish. And her profession was not something to be admired, but she's part of the genealogy of Jesus. And then we see Ruth, the woman of great character, also not Jewish, right? Woman of great character that's a part of, I think, like the great-grandmother of, of David. We see in there Josiah, the, the king of Judah, who after generations had gone away from God in idolatry, and said, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to repair the temple of the Lord. And I'm going to lead a nationwide repentance. One of the great kings of Judah. And then we see the name Zerubbabel, which is just an awesome name. right? I couldn't convince Jane to name our kids Zerubbabel. But, but he was a governor uh, when they were rebuilding after the exile in Jerusalem. We see these great people in the family tree of Jesus. But we also see in this genealogy some hitch moments as well. We see some things in Jesus' family tree that are probably episodes that, truth be told, not maybe the stories that you tell on the campfire to your kids. People that sin greatly. A reminder that Christ came into the world to save a sinful world by being born into a sinful family. But if we look at Matthew 1, verse 1, this is what it says. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, he says the son of David. Why is that important? And it comes back at first to 2 Samuel. I'm going to be all over the place in Scripture, so I hope you brought your flipping fingers. Today, right? 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verse 16, where uh, David is wanting to build a house for God, wanting to build a temple. And God's response is, no, you're not the one that's going to be, it's your son's going to do it. But this is what he says. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. God promises David, I am going to put a king on the throne forever in your family. Your kingdom will last forever. I noticed as I was preparing the sermon, I had noticed before, God doesn't actually specifically say that the Messiah, the Savior, will come from your family in this particular passage. But he says, your throne will be established forever. Your dynasty will go on. It's in the prophets is when God then adds in the Messiah. The Savior will also come 
from David's family. Specifically, in Isaiah chapter 11 is one passage. This is one of them that we might use around Christmas. Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 5. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Jesse is David's father. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of, under, of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy, with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked, Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. What is God promising there through David's family uh, in the prophet Isaiah? He's saying that not only will this be a kingdom that comes for, for, for David, but it will be somebody who will have the spirit of the Lord on him. He will not judge by what his eyes see. In other words, his judgment, his discernment, his wisdom will not be based on human senses and what he can perceive. But with true righteousness, he will judge. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. That's judgment. He will be in judgment over the earth. God is beginning to speak about a savior that comes through David's family. He further talks about in Jeremiah. Um, when Jeremiah is, is doing his ministry, Judah is about to fall. Jerusalem is about to fall. Isaiah already has. And so God says this uh, to Jeremiah about this this uh, king that is coming, he says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. God says to Jeremiah that he's going to be a Savior, as well as somebody who brings Israel and Judah, who have been separated, back together. This is going to be the son of David. God's people will live in safety. Matthew begins his genealogy by making sure that we understand that Jesus fulfills this role of the son of David. Jesus fulfills the one who is to come through David's line to be the king, priest, prophet, the one who would fulfill all of God has promised to David's family. Just in case there's any question about whether this Jesus qualifies as the savior of the world. Yes, he does. Prophecy predicted it, and this is what happened. We know in scripture, David is called a man after God's own heart. Was he a perfect man? No, he wasn't. David had some pretty big mess ups in his life. The biggest of which was found in, in 2 Samuel chapter 11. This is this, the story of, of David and Bathsheba. That passage begins this way. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and we'll stop there. Somebody pointed something out to me a few years ago about this passage that I hadn't really noticed before. That is what starts this whole saga, this biggest mistake, biggest sin possibly of David's life. What begins it? What was pointed out to me likely, David was bored. It says right there, at the time when kings go off to war, did David go off to war? No. Whether he just felt like I am getting old, I don't have as much, I'm not as good a warrior as I used to be, I can't do it like I used to. He decides to stay behind, maybe it's because there's something happening in the kingdom that needs his attention, but he sends the army out and the warrior king says, I'm going to stay home. And what happens sometimes when we're poor or when we're depressed, what happens when we're feeling down, uh, we're, we're, we're bored, we let our guard down. And David, who certainly would not have wanted to do what he did, does something absolutely, incredibly awful. Now, David already has six wives, right? God has already promised that through...
through his family that God is going to make his dynasty permanent. God has blessed David greatly. You'd think that David would be like, I'm going to avoid sin like the plague. I'm going to put every guardrail around my conduct because God has been good to me and I don't want to mess up God's promise in my life. And so I'm going to be very, very careful. And instead, I'm going to continue to play my harp and give thanks to God and sing my songs because God is good. But no, he does something wrong. Not only does he get Bathsheba pregnant, her husband is a man named Uriah, who's not just a soldier in David's army, but we later learn in the, New, in the Old Testament that he's one of the 30. In other words, he's like the cream of the crop special forces most dedicated guy to the army. And when David realizes he can't cover up his sin, that it's his child that Bathsheba is carrying, he has Uriah killed and then takes Uriah's wife Bathsheba as his own. So, looking at the Ten Commandments, he's an adulterer and he's a murderer. Now, he's confronted by it by the prophet Nathan, and when he's confronted, he repents, wholehearted repentance before God, as he says in Psalm 51, 4, against you, you only have I sinned. He repents, but again, is this a story that you're going to be willing to tell your kids about, this is our Grandpa David, what he did? Probably not. But as we go back to Matthew chapter 1, what do we see? We see and Jesse, the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Matthew doesn't shy away from the fact that Jesus is a direct descendant, not just of David, but of David and the wife that he got by unjust and horrible means. Now, God worked it all for good, but Jesus is a direct descendant of David and Bathsheba. There's other tough pages in Jesus' photo, a family photo album as well. We look at verse 2 in Matthew 1. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob. Jacob, now you might say, well, wait a minute, Jacob was a great man. Yes, he was. When Jacob passed away, he was a wonderful man of God. God had transformed his character greatly. I mean, he became Israel, right? The nation was, it's interesting, the nation wasn't named after Abraham. The nation was named Israel after Abraham's grandson. But it, it didn't, he didn't start out as Israel. He started as Jacob. God changed his name. Why? Because there had been enough mistakes in Jacob's life that he probably would have rather forgotten that it was just start over. You are now Israel. You're not Jacob, the man you were. You are now Israel. Sometimes a name change is a good idea. In Genesis 25, we read that Jacob steals his brother's birthright. In other words, the, the, the right uh, that, that comes with being the firstborn. Now, Esau isn't the brightest guy, and he goes along with it. But that doesn't make it right, right? I mean, parents, like if your kid takes advantage of another kid, it's not right, even if the other sibling's willing to go along with it. It's still not right, and it's inexcusable. And so, what does he do? Again, Ten Commandments, he, he breaks the thou shalt not covet. He covets his brother's birthright and schemes to get it. And then later, in Genesis chapter 27, Rebecca, which is the mom, she actually conspires, she conspires with Jacob to steal the brother Esau's blessing. Now, this, in this case, it's mama's idea, but again, Jacob goes right along with it, and uh, this is the verses 18 through 20 of, of Genesis 27. He went to his father and said, my father, yes, my son, he answered, who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, how did you find me so quickly, my son? The Lord, your God, gave me success, he replied. If you remember the story, like Isaac is old, he can't see very well anymore, and, and so he doesn't recognize that it's Jacob instead of Esau. And Jacob is just, he's just pouring on the lies, right? In fact, in this particular passage, we see that he breaks four of the commandments, 
right? He lies. Uh, he dishonors his father. He steals Esau's blessing. And he also takes the Lord's name in vain because when Isaac said, how did you like go out and find something and make it so quickly? How did you get back so quick? He says, oh, God was with me. Takes God's name in vain as well. Now, later on, God changes Jacob's name and character as life goes on, as you read Jacob's story. And so that when Jacob blesses his sons at his, on his own deathbed, he's much more godly than when he steals his brother's blessing. But we read in Matthew 1 that Christ is a descendant of, he doesn't say Israel. He's a descendant of Jacob. Later on down the family tree, in, in Matthew 1, verse 10, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah. And I want to focus on Manasseh right there. As it says, Manasseh was Hezekiah's son. Now, as you read the Old Testament, Hezekiah was one of the few really godly kings in Judah's history. Hezekiah loved the Lord and did his best to follow after God. Hezekiah tried to turn the nation back to the Lord and, and worked to tear down the idols and the false temples that were all over the place. He, he tore them down and tried to lead the people, we're going to worship God alone. But when Hezekiah dies and Manasseh takes over, Manasseh goes right back to work, putting those same idols, those same false temples, right back in place that his dad had torn down. And what's interesting, and this was pointed out in one of my commentaries when I was reading, was that Hezekiah, excuse me, Manasseh, was likely alive to witness some of the incredible miracles that God did during Hezekiah's reign. Like, read through the, there's some pretty cool things that happened. God intervened in Hezekiah's life and in Hezekiah's time as king. Manasseh saw it, but he still went back to rebuilding those false temples. This is what it says in uh, 2 Chronicles 33, verses 4 and 5, it says, He built altars in the temple to the Lord, of the Lord, of which the altars had said, My name will remain in Jerusalem forever. In both courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. Not only did he build other temples to other gods, but he even put altars to other gods in the very temple of God. He turns the temple of the one true God into a woke worship center where everybody worships everything. So he, these first two Ten Commandments, he breaks the first two on a regular basis and encourages other people to do them as well. And then we read in verse 6, he sacrificed his children in the fire in the valley of ben Hinnom, practiced divination and witchcraft, sought omens and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. So he says that he even sacrificed his own children to the false god Moloch, just like his grandpa Ahaz had done. Now there's good news with this, because we're told in verse 10 that he repents. This is what it says. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. So the Lord brought against them the army commanders of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh prisoner, put a hook in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. And when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea. So he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. And if you read on, Manasseh is a changed man. Tears back down those altars, those false temples, and he tries to lead the nation to serve the Lord only. He repents. Now what's interesting is that all three of these kind of difficulties in, in, in Jesus' ancestry, all of them turn to God eventually, right? David repented of his sin. Manasseh repented of his. And Jacob becomes Israel. He, he changes his character. But when you look at Matthew 1, there's others in this family history that, as far as we know, never repented, right? There's other kings that led people into idolatry that never repented of their wickedness. There's many others that we really don't know anything about them. But what we do know is that in Jesus' earthly lineage, he was a son of sinners. And so while we do so much to try to hide our own family dysfunction, Jesus Jesus' sometimes sordid family history is right there at the start of Matthew for us to read about. 
Now, should that concern us? Should that make us question whether Jesus is fit to be the Savior of the world? Absolutely not. Because he's also the Son of God. Though he was born into a sinful family, Christ never sinned, as Paul mentions in Galatians 4. In fact, Jesus says uh, in the story of Zacchaeus, remember that wee little man, Jesus says in uh, Luke 19.10, he says that he came to seek and to save that, that which was lost. Jesus came to save even the sinners in his own family. Because Christ never sinned, he is able to save the lost. And so where does this intersect with Christmas? Because so far, I've just talked a lot about the Old Testament. I've not talked much about Christmas. Because this is what it says in Matthew 1, verse 20 and following. But after he had considered this, that is, Joseph considered divorcing Mary, because he's assumed that she's been sinning. Uh, after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So all the sinfulness that we see, not only in Jesus' family, but in our own lives, and our own families, of the sins that we've committed, the sins that we still maybe feel condemned by, even though we've asked God 20 or 30 times to forgive us for them. All of that sinful messiness, God enters into that story. He enters right into the messiness of, of Jesus' family in order to save us by giving himself as a sacrifice for us. And that's what Christmas story is about. All the tinsel, all the lights, all the presents, all the get-togethers. What it's really about is that God entered into the chaos and the horribleness of the parts of our story that we'd much rather forget. And he enters into that and says, I'm going to save the lost. That's why I'm here. So we celebrate because Jesus would provide the sacrifice that allows a deceiver like Jacob to be forgiven. And for an adulterous murderer like David to be washed whiter than snow. And for a child sacrificing idol worshiper like Manessa to be restored, not because he did anything to deserve it, but because saving the loss is what Christ came to do. So although Jesus was born into a sinful family, the stain of that sin never touched him because he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He is holy. In all things, he is holy, yet he chose to be regarded as a sinner to take the penalty for our shame by being crucified as a criminal on a Roman cross. That's good news this Christmas season. And that's the message that we have for a world that celebrates Christmas but may not understand what it's really about. So what does this mean to us? Today. First of all, Christmas can be a time of great celebration, amen? And let's be honest, it can also be a time when we have to face family issues we'd much rather avoid. Do you have family drama? Do you have issues? Do you have things that, boy, you wish you could just sweep them under the rug and pretend they're not there? God understands. He understands. He's seen family drama. In fact, it's right there in Matthew 1. We've talked about some of it. It's a part of his story. And so, if you have family get-togethers that are awkward this year, if we get together with people that, oh, I have to see them. Take those issues to Jesus. Take them to Jesus. Because Jesus is the one that brings beauty from ashes. He's the one that restores the broken. Invite him to work it for good. And then pray for patience. 
perseverance is you. What are we, church? Salt. Oh. We seek to be salt and light in the midst of those circumstances. God understands. Take it to him. The other thing I would encourage us with as we close is that perhaps at times we feel like one of the people who we've talked about today, right? Maybe we feel a little bit like David sometimes. We're trying with all of our heart to serve the Lord, and then something happens, and a wrench gets thrown in our holiness. We're bored, or we're depressed, or we're whatever. We let our guard down for whatever reason, and we make a mistake, we sin, and then we just feel absolutely frustrated with your seeming inability to get it right. This is a season we can rejoice in our salvation. Repent. Pray for forgiveness, but then rejoice. Lean on his grace. And, and lean on the fact that despite our ongoing struggle with sin, Christ chooses to dwell within us. He continues to be Emmanuel, God with us, through his Holy Spirit that resides inside of us. Understanding that we did nothing to earn the salvation, that he has chosen to tabernacle to live with us. He has chosen to save you. And we have the promise that that salvation will not be left incomplete. So rejoice and be glad. For God has come to live with us and continues <coughs> to do so. In spite of our own shortcomings. Father, we thank you for the incredible story that we celebrate this time again. Lord, it's only really told in nine chapters out of 1189. Why do we focus so much on it? Because it's such an amazing story. What you did on the cross is the real victory. In the empty tomb, that's the real victory. But Father, Christmas, what we celebrate at Christmas is, is the start, the earthly start of that as if we witness God with us, Emmanuel, God in the flesh. Lord, I thank you that um, I thank you that you didn't demand that your child, that your son was born into a flawless family. Not that any of us could ever fulfill that, role. but neither does Scripture shy away from. The ugly parts. God, you bring redemption. You bring wholeness through pain and struggle. And so, Lord, we know that you can work all things for the good. And so, Father, um, for those things in our own families, maybe, that we're thinking about right now, we just pray that you would bring wholeness, that you would bring holiness. Where there's lostness, may people be found. Where there's sin, may there be, uh, may there be reconciliation with you and forgiveness and grace given. And Father, may we be the instruments of that grace as much as possible. Give us the patience and the perseverance to continue to love people and that sometimes we have a hard time, if we're honest, showing love as we ought. Help us to lean on you and trust that you can bring good through it. And Father, if there's times, and you know there's times, Father, from whatever the sin that we struggle with, we, we become frustrated because we just can't seem to get a handle on it. Help us to rejoice. But thank you for, Lord, the, the salvation and the grace, the forgiveness you continue to give us. Because, Lord, you will not leave that salvation incomplete. But you will work all things for the good, as you have promised. So you will bring to pass, because you are the God who keeps his promises. So, Lord, we just pray that this Christmas season... Uh, our joy would irradiate from our faces because you have done great things for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Please stand as we close the service singing the first Noel.
bless you and keep you this week. We'll see you again next uh, next Sunday morning. Um, be salt and light. Be salt and light this week. God bless you. Thank you.